Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, welcome to this lecture. And it is a lecture that will be conceptually a little bit difficult. <laughs> I tell at the beginning, and I think also that most most uh, lecturers on machine learning will probably omit that topic. But I find it really important, and I also find it really practically important. Gaussian processes. It's kind of an extension of a multivariate Gaussian distribution to infinitely many dimensions. Huh? And I think this is the conceptual difficulty. Yeah? To extend this covariance matrix to a, to a matrix which is infinitely long. But the advantage of that is that we can now not only draw a sample from a distribution, sample as a, as a random variable, but we can sample random functions. Give me a function which has certain properties. Huh? And we can select these functions at will. This will be our priors. Which functions do you want? Which functions do fit this actual problem? And using Bayes theory, we can get the optimum hyperparameters for these functions to, for example, fit an n-dimensional function. And this is really practical because actually you avoid overfitting using Bayes theory because you're integrating over all possible parameters that you could have. And this is the strength actually from, from the Bayesian approach, that you don't have to fight with overfitting. This is normally always the pro problem. You, you define a loss function, a lot of parameters that you have to fit on using an optimization procedure, but then you, you go into the problem of, okay, what is the complexity? Huh? What is the right number of parameters? Which one should I take? You have to regularize. So, and this regularization is done in the Bayesian topic autom automatically by integrating out when you calculate the posterior distribution. So you take every possible value of any parameter into account, weigh this parameter according to the distribution, and then you sample over these possible values of parameters. And for example, you can make wonderful extrapolations of data where you have data only in a limited scope of the predicted variables. And you can use this, for example, by using a random forest regressor, as you've seen, for example, in the city bike example. A random forest regressor can only predict things within the range of data that he's seen. Otherwise, this is just terra incognita. If you want to make now long-term predictions of things which are very hard to measure or which which are still in the future, this spatial approach is quite a good way to do it. Or if you want to have smooth functions, this is also a very nice thing, because then you can actually cope with the noise as an unknown and get the best fit over these functions. So, let's start. What is the goal? I think you understood now Bayes' theorem. We'll come back to it, first of all, in the exercises and at the beginning of this lecture that you actually we give a prior belief into what we have. And this is kind of a, a melting together of our assumption about something and the data that we have given. And the base framework is the best way to fuse those things together. Things that I know from, from my experience and data, hard data that I'll measure. How do you mix that together? The answer is use space. Okay, um, what is the difference between maximum likelihood approach and the maximum a posteriori approach? Could somebody explain this to me? So the main difference is the likelihood function gives actually the probability that we measure this data point given that model. So it's a probability how, how probable some measurement is. And <coughs> Maximizing that is a good approach. It's called the maximum likelihood approach. But it only gives us um, a point estimate. It gives one value of the optimal parameter. For example, if you do a linear regression with one theta, zero for, it, for the intercept and one slope, and nothing about it. We don't know how uncertain these parameters are. Using a maximum a posteriori approach means calculating really the posterior distribution of the parameters means that we say, okay, we do not calculate how probable a data point is, but we 
calculate how probable is this parameter given the data. So we flip it. And how do we do this flipping? By using Bayes' theory. Right? So normally, actually, we propose a model and want to test is this model OK, given the data. So we have to calculate the probability of parameters tender given the data. And this we can only do by using Bayes' theory to calculate the posterior distribution. And then we can say it was a good model. It fits quite well, and not by answering just the maximum likelihood approach. We'll see that again. OK. Um, Gaussian process can be considered as a generalization of a multivariate distribution, as I said, to infinite many, infinitely many dis uh, dimensions. And we draw not only actually samples from distribution, but infinitely many samples, meaning actually functions. We sample functions and we make priors over functions. We, we narrow our hypothesis space of possible functions that could actually be useful for this kind of prediction step or classification step by using certain, we will see, kernels, parameters, hyperparameters that restrict our class as a function of policy. And of course, we'll also do that in practice. Uh, just see how this works, how we can sample functions from a multivariate distribution. Good. Yeah, we have these two views, actually. Actually, the frequentist view, which would say only, da only data counts. Uh, we have evidence. Evidence is given by the data. And you cannot discuss it, the truth. Uh, if you measure it correctly, OK, there's no discussion about it. But, but very often we have some some experience about things huh? where you cannot assign frequent probabilities to things that only happen once, for example, huh? or very, very rare. And here the framework of probability distributions in combination with Bayes' theorems is a, is a really good way to match those things together. Um, <clears throat> Probabilities represent knowledge, and we can infer a new state of knowledge. We can predict things that we've never seen before in the light of new observations. We can also assign, actually, how reasonable this prediction is. And that is also a strength of the Bayesian view. Okay. Good. So, Gaussian process is kind of a, an extension of a multivariate distribution to infinitely many uh, dimensions. Huh? And it could be confusing. Huh? But we can only normally observe only a finite subset. And that's also the way how Gaussian processes are normally defined. That you say any finite subset of a Gaussian process is actually represented by, again, a finite multivariate distribution. So instead of defining a Gaussian process over these infinitely many samples, which represent the function, you normally restrict yourself to a finite subset. And the finite subset is actually given by the data points itself. So if you have n data points, you will restrict it to an n-dimensional multivariate uh, distribution. That's all you have. Huh? But you assume, actually, that beyond these data points, there could be more. And if I had more, this would be some dimensions more, you could extend it to infinity many. For example, imagine actually that we measure the temperature of the day every, every noon, midday, uh, 350 times a year, and this gives a 350 dimensional vector. But the fact that you measure just at noon is just uh, arbitrary. You could also measure in the morning, in the evening, or you could do both, or you could measure every minute. And that's the way of thinking behind this Gaussian process. Actually, there would also be values in between. And why only sample at noon? You could sample any point in between. So it would be a continuum of temperature values over the whole year. And it would be nice how we could, if we could re represent that series of temperature data over the year, given 365 data points only, but then to be able to predict any temperature in between. Or we could sample every hour and predict yeah, every, every minute in between, whatever. 
So the consequence would be to extend it to a continuum. We could measure at every second, every subsecond, every microsecond. Then you could say, okay, this is actually a function of the temperature, which gives my temperature distribution over the year. And I want to be able to sample this T, this big T from T, from small T, so the temperature as function of time. I want to get a model for it at once, huh? not only these sample points. And this is what you could do using a Gaussian process. Okay. The main mathematics behind it is the same as last time, and I don't want you to remember all this linear algebra. The main thing for you to remember is that if we have Gaussian multivariate distributions, you can calculate the posterior analytically, and you can calculate the conditional probability also analytically. And it will be again a Gaussian distribution. This is also called if the posterior distribution is the same as our prior. So it's a, if a Gaussian prior cause is actually a Gaussian posterior distribution, we call this a conjugate prior. And that's the nice thing, because linear algebra can be calculated really efficiently in high, 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 high dimensions. So this is a way, actually, these formulas behind it is just a reason why it's so efficient, why it's, why it's used at all. Because it can be calculated very efficiently. There's a second reason behind it, actually. Um, yeah. Second reason is actually that many things are Gaussian distributed, like noise. Huh? Gaussian noise is very often, it's quite frequent. So actually, the ninth property, the analytic property of the Gaussian distribution, and the fact that many distributions are similar to Gaussian distribution, make this method very proper. Huh? Well, this is just linear algebra here. Yeah. There's the precision matrix and so on. And maybe here, as I said yesterday, this is just a, an equation of a, a high plane. It's, a, it's in two dimensions. It's just a line, a straight line. How shift, how does actually my new, new value, the, the, the average value, change here as function of the other variable, xp? I'll make a drawing later. So the main thing for today is again Bayes theory. Bayes theory, and I try to explain it again. Our, our assumption about the world, our experience, comes in here in the prior. And the prior will, for example, be let's let's take the, the example of a linear regression. As it's also shown, I will flip now the camera, that you also have this on the... It's okay? No? Let's assume we, we look at the linear regression. How would a Bayesian expert look at it? <coughs> we have normally given some data points. And using actually the normal equations, which we also calculate today, we could get the optimal least square solution for the for these data points. Huh? But it's only one solution. Bayesian would say, yeah, it's not the full truth. Huh? If I take this point away, you'll get a different tether. If I take this away, you get different. If I add a point, you get a different tether. So actually these these parameters are randomly distributed. They're random variables. Huh? And the Bayesian would say, okay, let's say we, we point here Make a line of the least square solution using, using, for example, the normal equations. We would get actually a theta zero here from uh, maximum likelihood here, which would say oh, this is the optimal theta. And then we have a slope, theta one, maximum likelihood. And we would stop here and say this is the best you can do. A patient doesn't stop here. He says, okay, no, no. I, I have some, some idea about this theta, about this theta zero. And the theta zero is something like this here. It could be any. And this is my theta zero, let's say, on average. And it will give a prior to this theta zero, even giving a zero, a sigma zero, zero. So he says, you know, I, I know something about this theta zero, and I know about something about this theta one. Yeah. And I put this know-how in my priors. 
And this is what comes in here. Theta is a vector here from theta 0 and theta 1. Huh? And now he calculates the posterior distribution. Huh? What um, the normal equation just do is just he assumes, OK, the noise here is distributed like a Gaussian distribution. And he will calculate the likelihood. How likely is it that I see this point away from here? And we will calculate this by the likelihood function, which looks like this at this point. Huh? How likely is it, given the model, and the model probably I have to write, the model would be theta 0 plus theta 1 times x, if this is x. So it's centered at this value, y, and it's distributed like Gaussian distribution. And the likelihood function is actually the value on this, on this curve here. How probable is, is it? And we try to maximize this in the maximum likelihood approach. But the Gaussian approach would be, OK, also the slope has a distribution. And the distribution for the slope looks like this, for example. Uh, this would be the theta 1 distribution. This is just an example. And using this information together, we put this into the prime. Then we calculate the probability of the white cross given these parameters. This is the likelihood, uh, the likelihood function. And we can calculate it for every point here, for this point, this point, this. Sum it up, actually, or make a product out of it. That if this is Gaussian, it will be a sum of this. <coughs> and it, it ends up in the least square solution. And what you get out after the marginalizing out, this is just a normalization constant, actually. You get the probability of this theta <coughs> given the data. So this would mean, after putting in the data, this was my first prior knowledge, you will get something like this. Normally, it's narrower and centered at a different point. Huh? <coughs> this is then the posterior distribution. Huh? And now, we have a prior. We have just assumed, what is the probability the Titanic will sink? Oh, it's like this, huh? Huh? but it has certain distribution. After putting in the delta, we get a posterior distribution on the tetas. Huh? If this distribution would result on a distribution which is centered around zero, we could say, ah, I think this parameter might not be that useful. So this model, I have to correct it. Huh? But if it's significantly sharp here, huh? then we can say, OK, now it's quite certain that it is like that. And now we can assume how good is the model given the data? With the likelihood approach, you can only say, how good do these data match to the model I given? This is a question you can ask for every model. So you can try for every model, and you have to do it as well. Right? You make a grid search over certain models and say, OK, let's put in this model, this model, this model, this model, this model. And then you can assume, OK, take out the best. Huh? There's no free lunch. But here we go a step further. And what we get is actually a distribution over our assumptions. And we can say, with this probability, we can be sure that these parameters are correct. This is a step further. This is the main thing, actually. OK, go back. Now, this step is even further now. Assume now. We had certain points. We had uh, 100 data points here. Now somebody has measured again. Or wants to know, how does this behave over there? And then we can use the predictive uh, distribution. What comes in here is now this whole thing. Uh, it's hard to calculate. Huh? Some linear algebra, we put it in here. Now we put in the likelihood function of the new data. And just our average over the new tetas over these new tests. And you can do that as, as many times as you want. It's kind of a, a Bayesian updates step, it's called. Huh? You can do, as, as, as soon as you have new data, you can update your, prime, uh, your posterior distribution. Using this updated posterior distribution, you can make even better predictions. Huh? And this would look like that, for example, if somebody wants to know what is the world temperature in 2070, we would say, OK, I can give it to you. In a Bayesian approach, we would see that the uncertainty goes up like this. 
And we could make some prediction here, for example, like that. But we could also say that we're quite uncertain. Because we make a prediction in the future, and predictions about the future are normally difficult. And this is what comes out automatically from the Bayesian approach. Huh? It widens up here hmm, our uncertainty. Using just the maximum likelihood approach, you would just say, yeah, the most probable thing is here. And you know nothing about how, how valid actually your predictions are. Hmm? And using the Bayesian approach, you can do. Good. Yeah, this is actually what I explained. We did a linear model. The linear model here is actually a linear combination scalar product of a parameter vector times our axis and a noise somehow. Gaussian no? noise, for example. And then, yeah, here, with the noise with the variance sigma, and we calculate here the likelihood. The probability of the value y given x and the theta here. No? And it's actually. The distance or the, the probability here on this curve, on this one here. This is just the distance squared which comes in into the Gaussian. And we give a prior over our parameters. Here I've given two priors for each parameter one. Here we just say both parameters are distributed like a normal distribution centered at the zero point first of all. So we don't know anything about it, we just initialize it randomly. And then we can calculate the, the posterior distribution. And the posterior, because actually, if you have an exponential over a sum here, you, you get the product of the exponentials. Huh? And this changes it to this one, and you can calculate that. And that's how you do actually a, a Bayesian regression. <coughs> so we make predictions on some unknown data. And what these unknown data are, this can just be new example data. So you can do that every day on an online uh, learning platform. You say, I get a new, new data, let's take this information in and assume actually also that what we had so far is also valid. We met it together, you use the best of it using wave theory. Um, to calculate that, that's normally hard to do. Huh? Using Gaussian distributions, you can do it analytically, transform. If you take any distribution here, you have to actually go to numerical recipes. You have to sample these distributions. And these methods are then called Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, sampling methods, because you cannot do the integration anymore numerically in a, in a straightforward way. Then you go and sample. Okay, yeah, these are again the formulas, hmm? and it looks complicated, it's just a matrix product, so it is in fact not that complicated. This only shows that it can be done using Gaussian distribution. If we have different things, hmm? if you say, okay, it's distributed like a gamma distribution or something like that, nobody can calculate the posterior in analytic form anymore, so we have to risk re retreat actually to numerical methods, and these are called Monte Carlo methods. And that's what you actually get out, the difference again, you know, just doing a maximum likelihood approach will give you a point estimate, one best curve. Using a Bayesian approach, you get the distribution of all functions that are possible here. You can also do that by sampling different points here from the given data points, just leaving out some points, do again a fit, do again a fit, and then look at the distribution of the tethers. This you can also do using a bootstrapping method. Huh? Just say, okay, I have 1,000 sample points. I bootstrap from those 500 times. I make 500 times a curve fit, and I get 500 different pairs of parameters, theta 1 and theta 0. Now I plot the histograms over these tethers. Huh? Then I get exactly the same here. Then I get that. It's also a numerical way to do it, to efficiently do it. And here you would see, okay, the density of the curves is higher, so the probability that the function will be here is also this distribution is the posterior distribution. And you see, okay, if the points are centered here, these curves normally widen up like that. It means the uncertainty goes up in unseen territory. 
Good. One thing just for you to know, if you probably use that later, is you can really apply uh, Bayes' theorem easily also now in Python. For example, using the PyMC3 package. Uh, there's a Monte Carlo sampling method. And what, what I've shown here is that now, just not only giving actually a linear model for the prediction, uh, but also the distribution over the parameters in that model, we can now do the full posterior distribution. So what you do here is actually, we make a, a linear curve. Linear curve, two parameters, theta zero, which is the intercept and the slope. And we define, for example, the intercept as a normal distribution. Like I've drawn there, there is some value for theta not zero, but I'm not certain about it. I have some assumption about it. It's centered around zero first. And it has a sigma, this is 1 over sigma squared, actually the tau, the precision uh, of this value. This is what you put in as a prior. And the same you can do actually for the sigma itself. Here it's a half Cauchy distribution. And the slope is again a normal distribution. You see here, we put in not parameters that we want to estimate, we put in now full distributions, zack, in our linear curve here. And then we can calculate, using this simple command, sample, it starts a lot of things, huh? the posterior distribution. And the distribution of all of these parameters now. And I'll show it. So probably, if you try it out, PMC3, uh, I've lately made an update, and it seems not to be compatible anymore with NumPy. So I had to downgrade NumPy, but I hope they will update it soon. So with a downgraded NumPy, I can just demonstrate it shortly, how this sees, how this sampling works. Pardon? Okay. Um, so, let's see it here. Bayesian linear regression. Maybe the same thing. I import, no, you don't see that. Why don't you see that? Mm -hmm. uh, to close that. Now you see, huh? Okay. So we have just some data on calories or so. We can just plot them once. We take that and you see, okay. The data is quite broadly distributed. Probably it's not even a straight line. We could probably fit another model here. Um, let's say we do just a least squares linear, linear regression. This will be this one. Huh? There's one, one answer. It's the best possible thing if you assume that this data is Gaussian distributed about this. It's best line. And the prediction of the data point would just be put it into this linear equation, put it into this, this uh, equation of the straight line. Uh, that's how it looks like this, like this. Now, um, we do a different thing now. We make a, a model which consists really now as prior information uh, for the intercept, the slope, the sigma, the mean. These are all, all now actually, actually prior information, and this is actually the model we have. Uh, intercept plus slope times x. But this intercept is a distribution. It's a normal distribution. The slope is a normal distribution. The sigma is a half normal distribution. Okay, now to, to calculate the posture, actually, you need very powerful samplers. And this is called knots. It's not knots, so crazy means also knots. So it means no U turn sampler. And, and writing good samplers for probability distributions, it's, a, it's an art itself, it's a science, science for itself. Huh? Uh, just generating white noise is easy, you just take model operations. Huh? Uh, generating a distribution which is Gaussian distributed is also easy, you need two white distributions, you combine it. But generating distributions, random samples of any distribution, this is a hard thing. Huh? And to do it efficiently, this is really hard. It's called now what normally is used now is even a principle from Hamiltonian mechanics, which goes actually back to, to, to 
sort of the mechanics, how you calculate the tra trajectory. Actually. But we don't look, look into, it, into it, we just use it now. And I try to, to run it then, and it takes time. But I think, so it's defined now. And yeah, it should run now. Yeah, it's calculating. It's setting up the model. And then it samples for thousand steps. It's also done in, in multi-process steps. No, now it starts sampling. So it, it just draws samples of these distributions that I've given, propagated through the other distributions to calculate the posterior. And what I get, what I get now at the end, is the posterior distributions. So I don't have to care about integrating out the things anymore. I just have to find my prior information for the for the parameters I have. And this can also be done for, for, for finance. Huh? In finance, it's quite often done like that because you, you have quite difficult distributions there. Now we get actually the distributions before, after. And these are the posterior distributions. It means the slope would look like this. Huh? The mean value, this is also should coincide with the maximum likelihood approach and has a, a certain variance. So we can say, okay, I can say that actually the slope is around this plus minus this one. So we can give a, a, a valid range of this. Huh? We also see the rest actually, this is actually a histogram over these samples. That's what he does, a thousand samples, he draws from these distributions, at the end he just makes it a histogram. A similar thing you could do by just sampling out of the data points you have, if you have that many. Yeah? But this can be done with less data points. So Bayesian, Bayesian learning is actually is, is a, is a seamless way to, to fuse together, actually, your assumptions about the world and the data <coughs> that you mentioned. And things, on the one side, actually, they're discrete, discrete sample points. On the other side, we talk about distributions, our assumptions that the parameters should be in that range with a certain probability. And Bayesian, uh, the Bayesian theory is a way to, to combine this in an optimal way. Good, yeah, that's what you get out. Huh? You don't get out a snow, you get out a distribution over the snow. This would now be, this, is it yellow? I'm blind here. The distribution over, over actually a predictive distribution. You would say, okay, within 60%, 68%, all data points must be within that range. And this is just a simple linear problem. But this can be handled in many, many more dimensions. Okay, now the Gaussian processes. Huh? Imagine you have a distribution where you could just say, give me, give me kind of functions. Hmm? They should look like.